Hey guys, now this is another video request. Some of you asked me, hey Daniel, what exactly happens to us when we die? And this is a very important question because we will all die someday. In fact, there are 150,000 people that die every single day. One day, you and I will be one of them. So when you come to the end of your life in this temporary world, where will you go? Some say you will go to heaven, some say you will go to hell, some people say you will go to purgatory, some say no, you will just sleep and stand conscious. What is the truth? Well, let's go to the only source of truth that we have in this world, the only absolute truth, and that is the Bible. Let's take a look at what scripture says about what will happen to us when we die. Let's get to it. Now, just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I'm Daniel and welcome to DLM Christian Lifestyle. If you haven't subscribed yet, then please consider it and then also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos. Now, you need to know that as Christians, as believers, we do not need to fear death, our own death, because we look at it with joy, because we know that when we die in this fallen world, we will be with Christ in heaven. And then there will be no more tears, no more suffering, no more sadness. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, he says, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at a home with the Lord. This fallen temporary world is not our home. Our home is with the Lord and we can look forward to it with joy. Now let's take a look at what happens the moment we die. Now some believers say that when we die we go into a deep sleep, unconscious, until the second coming of Jesus. This is called the soul sleep doctrine. Now this doctrine basically teaches that when you as a believer die, at that moment, you go into a state of unconscious existence until the second coming of Jesus. Now, this doctrine is not really widespread and it was mostly taught by the Anabaptists at the Reformation and the Irvingites in England. It was around the 19th century. And then some Christians believe in purgatory. The Roman Catholic Church believe in purgatory and it is this place where your soul first go to to be further purified from sin before you can go to heaven. And then there are believers who say that when we die, our soul goes immediately to Christ and our body goes to the ground, to the grave. And it stays there until the second coming of Christ. When that happens, then we receive our body again. But then it's a resurrected, eternal body. And then, of course, God is going to make the new heaven, the new earth, and then we're going to live with Him forever and ever. Now, what about unbelievers? Well, some say that when unbelievers die, they will either go to hell for all eternity. Some say, no, that will not happen. Some say, no, they will just cease to exist. And others say, no, they will suffer for a while because of their sins, and then they will just cease to exist. This is called the doctrine of annihilationism. We just mean that God will annihilate them and they will just cease to exist. But what is the truth? The truth is revealed when we look at Scripture, but not just one verse, but at the whole of Scripture in a balanced way. Now let's look at purgatory first. What does the Bible really say about purgatory? Nothing. The Bible says absolutely nothing about purgatory. So where then does the Roman Catholic Church get the doctrine of purgatory from, if it's not in Scripture? Well, number one, they created it. Tradition. And number two, they found a little bit of evidence for it in the Apocrypha books. For example, 2 Maccabees 12 verse 42 to 45 says, 
Judas Maccabees, the leader of the Jewish forces, also took a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking into account the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness. It was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, listen to this, he made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sin. So here in 2 Maccabees, we see that they say it's fine to pray for the dead and to make an offering for their sins so that the dead may be forgiven. This is in contrast with the Bible. This is not what Scripture says. And you should know that the Apocrypha books is not equal in authority to the Bible. It is not part of the Bible and it should not be taken as authority or truth. The Roman Catholic Church, as I said before, believes in purgatory because of their tradition and because of here and there they get some verses in the Apocrypha. But the Bible doesn't say it and therefore it's not the truth. It's actually in contrast with Scripture because if you believe in purgatory, you're actually saying that what Jesus did on the cross when He died for our sins, it was not enough. You're saying that Christ alone could not make atonement for us. Because as we have just read in 2 Maccabees, Judas makes offering for the dead. Making atonement in Greek, exelasmos, meaning propitiation for the dead. This contradicts scripture because it says that Christ alone made atonement for us, for the whole world. 1 John 2 verse 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Purgatory teaches that we have to add something to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. This is a very dangerous and false teaching that goes against Scripture. Jesus alone paid the full price so that we might be saved. It is all over the Bible. And Jesus Himself said, it is finished. John 19 verse 28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So the teaching about purgatory is not true according to Scripture. So what about the teaching or the doctrine of soul sleep, which basically says that when you die, at that moment you go into an unconscious existence until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, this teaching is not really widespread. It was only taught by a few people at the Reformation, like the Anabaptists and the Irvingites in the 19th century. And still today, there's a lot of people who believe it. But even at that time, John Calvain, if that's how you pronounce his name, I'm Afrikaans. For me, it's John Calvain, but John Calvin anyway, he was against it. The real question though is, is it biblical? Well, the truth is that there are actually several passages that talk about sleeping when you are dead. To be precise, if somebody dies, it talks about sleep or falling asleep. You can find it in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, 5 verse 10, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 16, in chapter 18, in chapter 20, in chapter 51, and Acts 7 verse 60, chapter 13 verse 36, John 11 verse 11, and also in Matthew 9 verse 24 and chapter 27 verse 52. And then there are also some verses that seem to say that dead people do not have a conscious existence. Like the Psalm 6 verse 5, 
chapter 115, verse 17, Ecclesiastics 9, verse 10, and also Isaiah 38, verse 19. But when the Bible talks about death as sleep, it does so as a metaphorical expression. It shows us that death is only temporary for Christians, just as sleep is temporary. Now, for those of you who believe in soul sleep, just hang on a minute and just hear me out. Let's look at the Psalm 115, verse 17, that I've just quoted before as supposedly proving soul sleep. Let's take a look at it. It says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down into silence. So it seems as if it's talking about soul sleep here. But we can't just read one verse and take it literally. Let's continue to read the next verse. Verse 18 then says, But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From this time forth and forevermore. It doesn't say that we will first go and die and be unconscious for a long time and then we will be with the Lord. And No, it doesn't say that. Let's look at another verse supposedly proving soul sleep. John 11 verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Jesus doesn't say here that the soul of Lazarus is sleeping, nor does any other verse in Scripture or even say that the soul is unconscious. Jesus only said that Lazarus fell asleep. And then when the disciples thought he meant it literally, he said, no, 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 he's dead. Let's continue. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told him plainly, Lazarus has died. The other passages that supposedly prove soul sleep is the same. When the Bible talks about death as sleeping, it's just a metaphorical expression because our body will stay on earth while our soul goes to be with Jesus Christ. Our physical bodies will return to dust. Genesis 3 verse 19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But then scripture tells us that our bodies, our lowly bodies, will be like Jesus at the resurrection. Philippians 3 verse 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So God will transform our lowly bodies into spiritual bodies that will be able to live forever and ever, eternal bodies with Jesus Christ. He will do that at the second coming. But what about now? What if you die right now? What will happen to your soul? If you're not going to go to purgatory or sleep, then what will happen to you? Are there specific verses that tells us what will happen to us? Yes, and there are many. Let's go to the first one. Jesus says in Luke 23 verse 43, Truly, as if emphasizing that He's telling the truth, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said today, not after you've been in purgatory or after you had your soul sleep. No, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, meaning in heaven. So when we die as Christians, as believers, our soul, spirit, will go immediately to Christ. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 23, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Again, Paul did not say, my desire is to depart and to be in purgatory or to sleep until the second coming of Christ. He didn't say that. He said, my desire is to depart and to be with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8 says, yes, we are of good courage and would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So when you die, your soul spirit is away from the body. It's not in the body while you unconsciously sleeping there in, in your grave. No, it's away from the body, not in purgatory, but with the Lord 
in heaven. And Hebrews 12 verse 22 says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. Now listen to this next part. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So here it's basically talking about the believers who are already in heaven. And when you read the whole chapter, you see that when we come to worship God, it is not just in the presence of God, but in the presence of angels and the spirits of just men made perfect. This is a big cloud of witness. And when you go to the beginning of the chapter, you already read verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So this also shows us that those in heaven know a little about what's going on here on earth. And even the angels, they rejoice when one soul comes to Christ. Luke 15 verse 10 says, There is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Wow, imagine that. All the angels rejoicing over one sinner. This life is not our home. This world, not our home. It's only temporary and we're just passing by. Do you remember what Stephen said when they killed him? Read it with me. Acts 7 verse 55. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow, what a powerful message. And Stephen gives a certainty when he speaks full of the Holy Spirit in truth and says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So his spirit immediately went to Jesus Christ and his body went to the ground at the end when it said that he fell asleep. So here it is very clear that if he fell asleep, how can he be asleep if his spirit is then with Christ? You see? His spirit is with Christ, but his body is sleeping temporary until the day that Jesus will come again and resurrect our new bodies and make it like Jesus. Eternal spiritual bodies that we will live in, in the new heaven and the new earth. Now this also makes sense when we read 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9 to 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. Awake or asleep? We can't live with Him if we are sleeping unconsciously. It only makes sense if sleep just means death. And it does, as we have seen in Scripture. Now you only die once, your physical body here on this earth, and then you are judged. Hebrews 9 verse 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. For us as believers, when we die, we will be with Christ. But for unbelievers who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will go to eternal punishment. It seems like they will be sent to a temporary holding place, Hades, to wait for their final resurrection, their judgment and eternal punishment. Now, Jesus gave us an example of what will happen to us when we die. With the story of Lazarus, Luke 16 verse 22 to 23 says, 
the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So it shows us that the rich man's body was buried, but he was immediately tormented in Hades. And then, of course, later comes judgment, final judgment. Revelation 20 verse 11 to 15 says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Chapter 21 verse 1 then says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Wow, I can't wait to see and experience this. And now you, as a believer, know exactly where you will go when you die. And we look forward to it with joy. But at the same time, we are also sad. It saddens us to see those who might be lost. It saddens us to, to even think where those will go who do not want to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that is why we have to use the time that we have to share the gospel, to share the truth, so that people out there who are lost might be saved. Because time is running out. 150,000 people die every single day. And Jesus is the only way. In John 14 verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And John 3 verse 18 says, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Time is running out. Jesus is the only way. I know that I'm saved. I know for a fact. And that's why I'm wearing this shirt today. And I want to ask you, are you sure that you are saved? If you're not, then you need to be sure. And if you are saved, but you're a passive Christian, it's time to be active. Jesus did not call us just to become a Christian and just to live in luxury and do nothing and be passive. No, He called us to be disciples and to make disciples. You are the light of the world and it's time to shine your light, to share the gospel so that you can stand in front of God one day and when He asks you, what did you do of the talents and the gifts that I gave you? Then you can stand in front of him and say, God, I gave my all. I used what you gave me for your glory. Can you say that? If not, then it's time to start and to share the gospel. People ask me also, okay, so what then about people who has never heard about the gospel in some jungle or some places that have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ? What will happen to them? Well, I'm going to answer that in the next video that you will see here. Now remember, God loves you, and I love you too. Bye. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee.